We are so honored to have with us Father Craftsmith Nasser. Uh, Father Craftsmith came to Oklahoma City in 1982, correct me, anytime. And uh, St. Elijah's was a small community at that time. If you've been by the new church, you know it's monumental. And that has much to do with Father Constantine's uh, long tenure and powerful ministry there. Um, Father Constantine and I have a somewhat personal uh, relationship in that in 2020, a childhood friend of his passed away. They both grew up in the same village, North Jerusalem, North of Jerusalem, and that person's name was Frank Garage, a member of Trinity Lutheran Church. Was Frank Orthodox? Yes. No, I thought he was. Now, Frank had on again, off again, come here to Trinity to help with our reading program, very active in that for a number of years, a retired educator. And I remember talking to Frank in the hallway once when he was visiting again. And uh, I said, Frank, what's your background? Garage? That's an unusual name. Tell me. And he said, well, I was born here to do some songs. I said, oh, are you Orthodox? And he said, yes. And uh, he said, I've been visiting here for a while. He was getting a little limited in his movements and so forth. So going to St. Elijah's was kind of out of question physically. And he looked at me and he said, Pastor Roger, I've decided you're not going to like to hear this. I've decided that Lutheran is close enough. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in Frank's honor and to reverence Father Constantine, I wore my prettiest dress tonight. So, <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> but Father team at the invitation of Diane Duraj, came to Frank's funeral, gave an eloquent eulogy honoring Frank's memory, and it was such a privilege for me uh, to stand next to you at the funeral home because we couldn't have a funeral here and to uh, worship with you at that time. Bob played the piano at the funeral home and we tried to make as much of a worship service out of it as we could. When things blew up on October 7th, uh, I knew then that we had to do something. So I started talking to Father Constantine, I talked to uh, the Imam, Imam Hinchazi, and I talked to my good friend Barry Harris, the rabbi at Temple of the Highest Road. And um, there was some hesitancy, of course, because of all the conflict. We have armed security here tonight because in this day and age, we just really don't know what's going to happen. And uh, but it all came together because I believe. Uh, that this is of the Spirit, and that God wants us to do this. And uh, every Sunday since October 7th, we pray together the prayer for peace. It's on this card, we'll be able to get it. Let, raise your hand if you need the card, Lindsay will bring one to you. I don't have it. We'll just take more time to do that. Thank you, thank you. I actually found this uh, prayer online. It was there on October 8th. Um, a series of prayers online for what was happening in Israel and Palestine. And just as we prayed every Sunday since Ukraine was invaded for Ukraine. We prayed every Sunday since uh, the war began. Mm -hmm. 
So that's the way we'll begin this evening, and then we'll hear from Father Constantine. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of love, we lift up Palestine and Israel, their people, their lands, their creatures. War is a monster that consumes everything in its path. Peace is a gift shared at meals of memory with Christians, Muslims, and Jews. Let us burn incense, not children. Let us break bread, not bodies. Let us plant olive groves, not cemeteries. We beg for love and compassion to prevail on all your holy mountains. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let's welcome Father Constantine. Thank you, Father, for your uh, kind uh, hospitality, and uh, I am blessed to be here this evening with you to uh, speak to you on a very important subject, and the title is uh, Roots of Conflict and Resolution. <laughs> it's very difficult in a short time to speak about that. This is history of over hundred some years. But let me, uh, and let me begin to say that only you walk in the light you hold. I am holding this book. You have seen it. Do you know what's, how it looks in the back? Unless I do some work to turn it this way. So that's, that is the point I want to keep this in mind. Uh, that you only walk in the light you hold. My identity, you know, as a Palestinian, I was born in Jerusalem, and I do have my birth, copy of my birth certificate. It said that I am born in Palestine in English, Arabic, and Hebrew. So this is just for you to see. I was, I grew up in a village called Ephraim in the Bible in the book of John chapter 11, 54. After raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus fearing from the various sect that tried to reach him, he went to the Judean hills, which is about 15 minutes north of Jericho, straight up the hill. Like being in Alaska and Florida, less than 15 minutes, the temperature. And so Jesus came to this village, Ephraim, which is known today as Taipei. That's where Farah, the Raj, uh, I grew up in. And I grew with my family, ninth generation priest. And this is our home from 1568. And it was hit by many bulldozers. And finally, the year 2000, it was collapsed, destroyed. But in its place, and by God's grace, we're able to have a chapel called the Chapel of the Cross of Many Nations and the Grotto of the Twelve Apostles. The roots of our family came from Horan, from Syria. And in history prior to 1917, 1914, that land was captured by the Ottoman Turks. And known in history, Palestine and greater Syria. There was no Iraq, there was no Lebanon, there was no Palestine, I mean, there, there was no Israel, there was uh, no Gulf countries by specific names. That's called Palestine 
and greater Syria till after the World War I. So this is where I grew up. We have a property, like you have property, and you have to have documents. So we have documents of some of our properties with a Palestinian stamp, which is indicative that there was a country called Palestine. And as a little boy, my grandfather would give me a piaster to go and buy ice cream or something. So here's a monetary that speaks on it, written on it, English, Arabic, and Hebrew, Palestine. So, uh, I am a Palestinian, proud to be one. I am an Arab, and I am a Christian. Arabs, Christians, Muslims, and Jews have lived for centuries in peace and harmony. From my childhood memories, I want to share, in 1954, I, my dad would take me uh, to Jerusalem from the village, and my dad uh, will let me be with my grandparents when he does it, to the Petir Gate to do his, his, his visitation. And I heard as a 10 years old, 10 years old, my grandfather talking about his friends. If you've been in Jerusalem, uh, where the Holy Sepulchre is located, just next to the Holy Sepulchre, there is the largest tower of the Lutheran Church. And my cousin is the main custodian, oversee the whole operation. His name is Jacob Kuri. He's still there. My grandfather and his friends, one of them, I'm already done because that's what he's remember, and I remember Aaron Stern and Muhammad Ibrahim, Muslim and Christian, were playing cards. And somehow something happened. Explosion took place. And that was on July 12, 1946, when King David Hotel was exploded, destroyed. Uh, the King David was the center of the British administration by the Argun, the various groups who rose within the Zionist movement. And I remember that story because my grandfather found difficulty because he wanted to see his friend Aaron. He saw Muhammad, but he didn't see my Aaron. Later on, Aaron came because Jerusalem is divided into sections. You have the Jewish section, you have the Christian section, you have the Armenian section, and you have the Muslim section. But later on, Aaron meets my grandfather because they know each other, they've been home with each other. And my grandfather found out that Aaron is an Orthodox Jew. I do not know whether you know what the Orthodox Jew is versus this and that. Orthodox Jew. Orthodox Jew belong to a a group they are called Naturi Karta. Naturi Karta. Just the way sound. You Google it and you will learn about Naturi Karta. There's 1.9 million Orthodox Jews in the world, overseas and in New York and many other places. Who stands? Who stands to to tell you who they are. 
Naturi Karta, I want you just to listen to, well, I guess I, maybe I don't have the internet here. Naturi Karta, these are rabbis, Jews, who stands holding the Palestinian flag in Jerusalem and in America. If just only, if just only the media will give a rabbi one minute to explain his position, the whole world will change about the problem. But the media is controlled. So Naturi Karta are Orthodox Jews who stand for the Torah. They look for the spiritual search of connection with God, not with earthly things, for the Messiah to come. But these are anti-Semites, now are considered. So if you speak against Zionism, which I speak about, that I am anti-Semite. And these uh, rabbis and followers are crushed, just like the possible, to a certain extent, humiliated uh, by the Israelis. Now, I, I wish I could uh, get that uh, internet here, but it's okay. The other one, I would like another story that I want to bring forth as a child before I came to America in 1961 is about the discussion of my grandfather with his friends about the massacre that took place in Israel, in Palestine, massacre of Deir Yassin, a village totally wiped out, April 9, 1948. The atrocities and the genocide of killing people right and left, that terrified the Palestinian people to run away from Palestine and being forced to leave Palestine. Over 107 were murdered, many wounded, and as fear seized them, they ran away. Historically, a little over 750,000 Palestinians ran away to different parts of the world, settled in Lebanon, in Jordan, in my village, in Iraq, in Syria, there's approximately today close to 25 to 30 million Palestinians. Okay. Villages have been eradicated. Arnold Toynbee, a British historian, wrote a book, Justice, I mean, a book written, Justice and Only Justice, Palestinian Theology. He writes, and I'm quoting now from our British historian, he said, by the end of the war of the armistice of 1949, the total Palestinian Arabs exodus amounted to about 700 and 50,000, reflecting on the tragedy Arnold Toynbee observed on January 31st, 1961, that the treatment of the Palestinian Arabs in 1947 and 1948 was as morally indefensible as a slaughter of six million Jews by the Nazis. Dr. Tombi went on to say that the Arabs had been robbed of their territory and cruelly treated through not comparable in quantity to the crimes of na the Nazis, it was comparable in quality. So the Paragona box was now fully opened and only 
and only more injustice, misery, fear, and bloodshed were awaiting the Palestinians. Coming to America in 1961, I said, I am nine generation priest. My daddy, uh, Father Zachariah, as his soul, came to America by the help of the Lutheran and the Methodist to come to raise fun because we have refugees in the village. Families need food. Students need to go to school. And there were, we have uh, schools in different houses in those days. Poverty. So my dad came to this country, and I came to this country, and he was living in Omaha, Nebraska. Now, remember, I am a child of... Uh, uh, then, when I heard the story of the Deir Yassin massacre, and then about the story of our, uh, my grandfather with Muhammad and Arn, uh, Aaron, about the explosion, and later on began to learn about the atrocities and the wars that's happening. I was very scared when I came to America. Uh, I came on Friday night. We slept and woke up in the morning. And here behind, uh, from the, my window, there is a building and there is a glass uh, uh, windows, large, large, large ones. Um, and I saw people, and what I saw, I saw people with their yamaha and their uh, dresses, and I looked, and I shouted to my father, I said, are we here? What's next door? Is the synagogue? We're going to be killed. I mean, that's the fear that I got. I can tell you, I spent maybe good two, three months. I didn't go beyond behind my house, behind the house. I was afraid that I would be attacked, uh, killed. And my, there's a story how everything reconciled and discovered that we are living in America, in the land of the free, where justice prevails, where liberty is called. Where's the spirit of Abraham Lincoln? Thomas Jefferson, Adams, these leaders who build the foundation that we have. And unfortunately, if they could wake up today and to see what they have planted, they will turn over their graves because that's not America that you know. Absolutely not. So I went to college, high school, college, seminary, and served two parishes in Iowa and in Oklahoma City, been giving lectures at various colleges and universities, been invited because I'm a Palestinian. And unfortunately, let me say that uh, uh, the people of the West do not understand, don't know the history, is suppressed history. When I was at Iona College, which is Jesuit College, a good college, taught me very well. It's a Catholic college. My last year, I majored in history. And my last year, uh, I want to graduate, and it happened that I saw a, I saw a name by the name Miss Kowet, or Kathy. And I did not really understood the names of the Jewish names, but Cohen, I said, well, it's possible an Arabic teacher. So I will take her course. So I took her course, and find out she was a Jew, and she has a dual citizenship. And you know very well, in this problem, the war in Palestine, in Gaza, and on West Bank, large contingent of Jewish people, men, are at the war. America is the first highest mercenaries 
the next is the France, the next is it, uh, uh, Britain, okay? And these people go being, being brainwashed and die over there and suffer for no reason whatsoever, whatsoever. So, Ms. Kuwait Cohen, uh, in order to ensure that I will pass her class, this is my paper for my graduation, I chose on Belfort Declaration. I will speak about that, so you will know the history. But this is my, my paper and her comments here. So, just to show you, when I became a citizen, my citizenship as a Jordanian, because Jordan was, took over uh, uh, Palestine, I have passport, they took it from me. Only I could have only one. And every time I arrive to the airport, I am asked, do you have a Palestinian citizenship? Do you have a paper from Jordan? And so forth and so on. And I said, no, I don't. So those, for some, you, it's okay. For others, absolutely not. So, most common question where, to me, where are you from? Whether at the airport, uh, whether uh, sitting uh, with uh, someone and being introduced, I say, I am from Palestine. Uh, uh, it's an amazing look. It's an awe, like I'm coming from outer space. And especially when I say I'm a Christian, this is even further out of space. So it's really very, very tragic, my beloved. So Theodore Herschel, the founder of the Zionist movement, for your knowledge, in the late, in the middle of 1800, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, were emerged national movement, the rise of the national movements. And I want you to know that the Jewish people, unjustly, they have suffered on the hands of countries, whether Spain, France, Italy, England, Russia, Germany, and other places. As a result, if I'm a Jew, I want to find a place to live in, free. So here were persecution against the Jewish people, and people rose to find identity, where to live in peace. So there was enthusiasm about a national movement for a home. And of course, these leaders began to plan from this country to this country to that country. Do you know, here's a list. Um, proposed plans for the Jewish state. Ararat city in the United States. The British Uganda. The Jewish Autonomous Oblast in Russia. The British Guyana. Fuji, Plan, Madagascar. Port Davy in Australia. Italian East Africa. Argentina. All these leaders proposed places. Finally, they settled on Palestine because it has spiritual connection roots. It is important for you to understand the biblical connotation in dealing with the question of Abraham, the seed of Abraham. We say, may you be rested in the bosom of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, our forefathers. But you know, God made a promise to Abraham. We will come, and if we are Christians, Muslims, 
And Jews, we have our father, Abraham, to honor, to follow the righteous man. His life before wasn't righteous, but there's a space for conversion. And so God, in Genesis 17:9, God promised to Abraham was conditional, not absolute. And God said to Abraham, Abraham, thou shalt keep my covenant, and thou, thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. The promise of Abraham was physical, territorial, not spiritual. Genesis 12, 1, 3, and God said to Abraham, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee and I will make thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make you make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing and I will bless them that bless thee and I will curse him that curse thee and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. To be of God's covenant with Abraham, his descendants, must keep God's law. Did they have kept the law? The word Israel means the obedient soldier. Where Jacob fought, wrestled with himself, to follow the devil or to follow God. That means to follow the commandment, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. That's why this 1.9 million Jews in the world belong to the Orthodox Jews, Naturi Karta, don't believe in physical, they believe in the spiritual. And Deuteronomy 9, 1920, and it shall be if thou at all forget the Lord thy God and walk after other gods and serve them and worship them, I testify against you this day that you shall utterly perish as the nations which the Lord destroyed before your face so shall ye perish because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. When Abraham married Hagar, lived with Hagar, Sarah was in Hebron, in the land of the Hittite. And the news came that Sarah died. That's her husband. He went to Hebron and he was welcomed by the leader of Hebron and said, I will give you the cave. I will give you the land to bury your wife. And he says, no. Abraham said, no. Thank you very much. I want to purchase the cave. I want to purchase the land. And he put, read your scriptures in Genesis. For he bought it for 400 shekels. He set the principle of justice, Abraham righteousness. Where is it today? Where is it today? And so I'm mentioning this because what we see and what we hear about the state, there's lots of Jews in the world who don't agree with what's going on. Jewish mother weeps just like a Palestinian mother, whether she is a Christian or a Muslim. But the rise of Zionism have brought destruction. In the book, and I encourage you to uh, 
search this book. This is Mycopalid. Mycopalid is the son of an Israeli general, Matthew Palad. Matthew Palad is the son of another general, his father, grandfather, who was his signature on the creation of Israel. And Michael Pallad now lives in Washington, D.C., was in California. He's a travel the country and teaches bringing re sense of reawakening about America to be a, a fair uh, peacemaker, shall I say. But also he's trying to teach the West about, not about Judaism, about Zionism. Zionism is a cancer, he would say. And he grew up in, in the army also. And when he realized what he began to see after I finished his army and his commission and his studies, he began to have different understanding of the truth about what happened to the Palestinians and to the Jewish people here and there. And so he wrote many books, among them, The General Son. And he speaks about that. And Michael Pallad, trying to say to America and to the West, wake up. Because the government that has been ruling the state of Israel, very, very extreme to the extreme to the extreme. And his fear is that because of the extremism, which, which is witness now, the state will be annihilated. So out of love for his grandfather, out of love for his father, for his niece that was uh, killed and others, uh, he's trying to reveal the truth. Wake up America, wake up the West. Wake up, you Jewish people in this world. Don't be brainwashed. And that is what happened with Michael Pallet. So I'm mentioning this book for you. Hopefully you can look it up. In fact, I get my book. I gave it to someone, and I ordered it just four days ago just to hold it in my hand. So if I need to read, to reflect. His grandfather became, um, his father became an activist, peace activist. And there are Jewish people who are also marching today throughout the country here and there, peace activists. Because that's going to reflect on their existence. Anti-Semitism, I'm a Semite. So when I speak, I'm not speaking against the Jewish people, the question is not. Jews is Zionism, ideology, secularism. People who don't, if you hear the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, it is today in Tel Aviv. Anything that is bad, and bad, and bad, and bad of Sodom and Gomorrah, it is there on the streets. There is no models anymore of those for their forefathers who have fought, who come from different parts of the world. So Matt, Matty Pallet, the general who fought in the 67 war and became a professor traveling the world and the country, this man to speak about the awakening about what's happening to the Jewish people and to the state of Israel. He said, oppression brings Greed. The greed brings superiority. Superiority brings racism. And that's what we have. The distorted, fabricated images about the Palestinians, we are terrorists. We are 
killers. We are animals. That's where the leadership today telling us we are animals. The West brought injustice and suppressed the truth. And as we know, they said the truth will make you free, right? In time, the truth will make you free. Let me share with you some comments. This is uh, from Joseph YZ, head of the Jewish Agency Colonization Department, 1940. Quote, between ourselves, it must be clear that there is no room for both peoples together in this country. We shall not achieve our goal if the Arabs are in this small country. There is no other way than to transfer the Arabs from here to neighboring countries, all of them. Not one village, not one tribe should be left. Here's David Ben-Gurion in his diary, 18, 1948. We must do everything to ensure they, quote unquote, the Palestinians never do return. Assuring his fellow Zionists that Palestinians will never come back to their homes. That's what's happening now. The oldest will die and the young will forget. And let me tell you, for centuries to come, the young will never forget. Palestinians will live. And they are Jewish Palestinians, Arab Palestinians, Christian Palestinians, Muslim Palestinians. Here's another statement. One of the most enduring and deceptive slogans of Zionism was coined by Israel Zangwill almost 100 years ago. Palestine was a land without people for a people without a land. And quote. Few more than I stop on this. After paying a visit to Palestine in 1891, the Hebrew assessed Ahad Ha'am commented, abroad we are accustomed to believe that Israel is almost empty. That's what everybody thought in the West, right? Nothing is growing here. And that whoever wishes to buy land would come here and buy what is his heart desires. In reality, the situation is not like this. Throughout the country, it is difficult to find cultivated, uh, cultivable land which is not already cultivated. There are people, Palestine. Golda Meir said, how can we return the occupied territories there is nobody to return them to. There was no such thing as Palestinians. They never existed. June 15, 1965. I wish I could put the, 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 uh, the, ah. Uh. One second. What was, all, what was all this area before the First World War? When Britain got the mandate over Palestine, what was Palestine then? Palestine was then the area between the Mediterranean and the Arabian border. You say there was no such thing East as Palestine. East and West Bank, no. East and West Bank was Palestine. I'm a Palestinian. From 21 until 48, I carried a Palestinian passport. And there was no such thing in this area as Jews and Arabs and Palestinians. There were Jews and Arabs. And now she says, there was no such thing as Palestinians. They never existed. Uh, 
the last one I, I, I uh, let me see the last one I would mention here uh, by Rafael Etiam, Chief Staff of the Israeli Defense Force. Okay, 1983, he says, the Palestinians should be crushed like a grasshoppers. Heads smashed against the boulders and walls. That's Isaac Shamir who said that. Now this Raphael Eaton said, when we have settled the land, all Arabs will be able to do about it, will be to scurry around like a dra drugged cockroaches in a bottle. Okay. 400 villages will erased in 48 out of the map. Palestinians from 48 till today are in a big prison. Humiliated, their homes destroyed, their orchard are cut, their churches and their mosques. No food, hard to find a job. You have about five millions on the West Bank and Gaza, and about three millions or less inside the state of Israel. And those people lived peacefully with the Jewish people. When the Jewish people being persecuted in Eastern and Western Europe, Reverend Father, Do you know where the Jews escaped? They escaped to Arab countries. And if you find, to study the history of, of their journey to the Arab countries, they claim, they claim themselves they were in the golden years of their lives. Golden years of their lives. Let me, uh, uh, speak here from all what happened to 48. You have the war of 48, the war of 67, the war of 73, the Antifada of 87, 19, the Oslo Accord in 1993, the Antifada of 2000, Gaza War 208, Gaza Pillar of Defense 212, Gaza Operation a protective edge 2014. All these wars, all these events took place to suppress and crush the Palestinians who want to be free, who want to have their freedom. They are in a big prison. The apartheid state and who support more than anyone else, America. Britain, Italy, France, Germany. The Holocaust, yes, we are against the Holocaust and we condemn what took place to the Jewish people in the world, but not on the expense of the Palestinian people. Let's give all our land to the deserving people the Indian people of this nation who put them in, in settlements here. Justice, and only justice. And people need to be free to have their rights. The intifadas continued, the uprising continued, whether on the West Bank or in Gaza, to a point that they could not remain silent. Palestinians rose up. You may call them terrorists, but I can tell you, they are freedom fighters. They are, want to be liberated. Somebody asked me if, if I support Hamas. Hamas is an organization. 
the, the Muslim movement is an organization. Fatih is an organization. Like you have the uh, Democratic Party, you have the Republican Party, you have the Independent Party, you have all kind of parties. But everybody is trying to find a way to be free. Since the Oslo Accord 1993, not one decision was passed to help the Palestinians. In fact, took land, 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 land. Let me show you um, a map here. Uh, where is One second. Well, I thought I had a map here somewhere hidden. But the Palestinian land, for example, I live in Taibe in the village of Ephraim. I can tell you I have 28 acres of land. Settlement is on it. I just was there a few months back. When the war started, October 7, I was in my village and we were able to find a way to get uh, from uh, from Taibi to Jordan to Dubai to come to America. It wasn't an easy journey, but we made it to come to back home. But in my village, we have settlements. And Oslo Accord have divided the land into A, B, C section. The towns or the villages are A. B is controlled by Israeli and Palestinians. Palestinians are really agents. There's nothing. I mean, those in the Fatah organization. And the C is a C you cannot touch. So I have majority of my property in B and C. And B and C total that I cannot touch is about 60 acres. There are buildings on it, but I cannot go over there. I can see them from far away. Two months ago was the season harvest of olives. And what happened with the extreme government today with Israeli, with Netanyahu and Ben Gafir and others, there is a close to seven, eight, 800,000 settlers on the West Bank. What left for Palestine is 30% from the original 100%. What happened with the 30% lately? There is 200 some settlements. On them live all these people, which this extreme government gave everyone an ammunition, gun, to terrorize the people so they can leave. The mayor of my village and the people in my village were giving certain dates for certain area to go and harvest the land, uh, harvest the orchard, uh, the olive orchard. They went to this area around noontime or so, three settlers with their guns, walked at them, terrorized them, shot in the air, hit somebody on the head, stole the car, stole whatever was collected. And everybody ran, disrupted the whole village life. But it's not only there, every place else. A week later, another person from the neighboring village was killed, was shot. No accountability whatsoever. People are living on their nerves. And when we think, where is the spirit of America, the model of democracy? Where is Biden? Destroying and giving bombs and bombs and bombs. The problem, my family, is that everything is suppressed. Speaking about Jimmy Carter, Nelson Mandela, David Wepper, the world needs to know about 
clearly this. This conflict is between ownership versus occupation. Very simple. If I come to your home and kick you out, what are you going to do? You better be silent. You're going to stand up for your rights. You have a defense. If not defense, you're going to get the gun. You're going to fight. Ownership versus occupation. Justice versus injustice. Right versus wrong. We are not against Jews. We are against the ideology of secular Zionism, which has nothing to do with Judaism. In fact, this is dishonoring the life of the Jews. As a Christian, I believe that all of us need to sacrifice and give up. And I believe in two-state solution. Everybody is calling for two-state solution. Give the Palestinian their land, 30%, which is, which is now, right now, is less than 16% because of the settlements. What I mean by, okay, in my property and other villagers' property, uh, in my village, there is a big settlement. Okay, let's get the settlers out from there, bring the Palestinians who are in camp to live there. I have to give up something as a Palestinian. I'm willing to give up my land to host other Palestinians who are in tents. Everybody has to give and take to go exist. And how are we going to exist if you cannot have somebody to talk with? Oslo Accord have not produced anything. We are controlled by the media. Absolutely, as I say to you, if just Golda Meir, what you have heard, be on ABC station, whatever station here on TV, things will change. They are not permitted. Controlled by our government. Thirteen top positions in the state, in the, under Biden, are by Zionists. Controlled, our country is controlled. Economically also is controlled. So we have a voice. And we have to work hard to not to bring hatred, but to bring sense of understanding to the truth. I'm sorry that I'm delaying. It's just an hour, right? A few more minutes, I will conclude. OK? I wanted to, uh, yes. Could I just interject? Yes. Yes. You know, I talked to you on the telephone, and, and you have just enlightened me and informed me so much. What are, one of the things that I've taken away from your teaching is that to the way we cast people uh, who live in that area, that the Palestinians are Muslims. They're not. There's a Palestinian right here. He's an Orthodox Christian priest of one of the highest populations, uh, population centers of Christianity. Uh, he's right outside Jerusalem. It's a town called Bethlehem. There are hardly any Christians there now. A am I correct? Yes, yes. yes. I'm, I'm pretty sure you told me that. <laughs> and it's because of the Zionist agenda, uh, the Israeli government agenda, uh, our former bishop emeritus, Floyd Shehol, spent a lot of time in Israel, and he educated some of us clergy about this, that Christians are leaving this area. There's, there's no hope, there's no hope for them too. There's, yes, there's no hope. And then the other thing that we talked about one day, you talked to me about, um, was the fact that Israel has always been, almost always been, a nation that has been uh, occupied and dominated by imperial forces. Even long before Rome, imperial Rome. You spoke about the Germans. 
Right. And the church that has the beautiful tower, it's now called Redeemer Lutheran Church. When it was built, it was called Kaiser Kierkegaard. Right. The Kaiser's Church. Some nation, France, Germany, um, England, um, Italy, have occupied this land where you and your people and the Jews and the Muslims should be able to live free with one another. That's what we lived before. Yes. That was how the people have survived before, even if you read, even if you read the Edict of Toleration, the Edict of Omar ibn Khattab in 638 AD when he entered Jerusalem, he presented that edict in that he, he spoke in that sense in the edict that anyone who owned properties Christians or Muslims, uh, Jews, excuse me, and specifically mention the Christians and the Jews to be honored. Mm -hmm. To be honored at OU years back, Dr. Uh, Professor David Bowen initiated an institution for local peace. Yeah. And I was uh, on the board of visitors then. And I was invited uh, to be part because I had met a pastor in town. His name is John Benefit. You know who is that? Yeah. John Benefit in the Church of the Rock. I did not realize that my secretary is from his church. I never asked the secretary what denomination, what church you go to. But it happened that I was taking uh, tickets of our, our Mediterranean, our day sale, even complimentary with the three miles radiance. And I ended up forgetting going to that section of the town. So I did, and I met this reverend, and he, he sat down, and he knew something about me. I said, how did you know? I said, my secretary, is, is, is uh, my, my, my parishioner is your secretary and she brings you all the information. I said, that's great. Then in the conversation, he said to me, God has spoke to me. Did you ever feel that way that God's speaking with you? I hope he does. I said, Reverend, I'm still waiting for his voice. <laughs> <laughs> what did he say? He said, wait a minute. He goes, he's still alive, by the way. Yes, yeah. He goes to his office somewhere and comes back with a sheet of paper. And he says, wait. By the way, this is the map. <laughs> how, how it was, where you can't even see anymore what left for us from the yellow to, to the yellow over here. So he says, uh, I read it. Synopsis says, I. Reverend John Benefield, chosen by God to be a mediator to bring peace between Christian Muslims and Jews. Da, 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 da. I said, oh my gosh, that's wonderful. I said, uh, then he said, you know, I received the invitation to go to OU because there's a, a conference on the status of Palestine, on refugees, on water, on Jerusalem. Really? I'm from Palestine. I keep them from my community involved at the university. They never told me about it. So they give me, I asked him to give me a copy. And he made me a copy. I called my people. The vice president of the university is a member of my church, the lawyer of the university, a member of my church. There is something in it. I should know something about it. Anyhow, I got an invitation and here, uh, here uh, I go to attend and here Reverend John Benefield. Jay Swallow, Chief of the Indian Nation, and myself as observer in a hush hush area at the university. Nobody knew that it was the conference to be taking care of. Discussion for two days on the status of the Palestinian issue with Israel on borders, water, Jerusalem, refugees. And from that conference, we went to Jordan. From Jordan, we went to Israel. We went to Jerusalem. I was with them with lots of delegations 
but I was an observer. Reverend Benefield established a concert of prayer where pastors, ministers of different denominations will gather to, to, to pray. So I felt good. I said, you know, why not start on over here? So I, every first Tuesday of every month, they meet about 50 pastors, ministers. Then you go to other towns and you meet with them. And I really enjoyed what I saw. Really, I felt I want to go. So we were busy building St. Elijah. And uh, after a year or so, I did go. Finally, I decided to go. When I went to go, Reverend was so kind, he always made me sit next to him. And every priest would say something about his immediate need, immediate need to pray for. And I don't know them because they change. I mean, uh, new people, then I've been away. So there and then I'm sitting there, and there's a pastor. I never met him before. He said, I want you to pray today for President George Bush not to grant the Palestinian a homeland. Just like someone fears me. So I held my cross just to keep me calm. <laughs> my dad told me told me that when you get angry, you put your hand on your watch to come down. Your wife and her wondering to come down. So I put my cross to come down. And I asked the pastor, Reverend, could I have your Bible? So he gave me the Bible. And I opened the Bible to the letter of Philemon. Very small passage. I read it to myself, then I need to respond. So when the time came, I could ask, uh, could I speak? I took the microphone, and I read from letter to Philemon, Paul to Philemon. And it speaks about how joy to be among the brothers. How wonderful to be with your friends. And I said, I come here to be among my, my friends. In the spirit of the scripture, I really do. But I said, I'm sitting here, hearing my brother whom I don't know, ask him, ask to pray to the president of the United States, not to grant the Palestinian homeland. I said, where is the spirit of this nation? Where is the spirit of Abraham Lincoln? George Washington, Jefferson, Andrews. Where is it? I said, we as Christians, we pray for our president of the United States, maybe more than any other denomination in the service. We remember at every occasion, but my brother who doesn't know me, I am a Christian. I am an Arab. I am a Palestinian. I said my home is there. Many millions of Palestinians were kicked out from their homes. Refugees. And I said to him, I said, I, as a Palestinian, Pray for peace, pray for, for equality among people. My home destroyed, my land is a settlement ground. People come from everywhere, living in these settlements and giving money just to live there. And I said, after so and so, I said, Reverend Father, I didn't say Paul, because he was a, a, 
Reverend is a minister. So I said, Reverend, I don't know you. But I said, if you have a shack, a piece of land, in Oklahoma City, to replace what I have lost, I will crawl on my knees and kiss your feet. That's what I said in front of 50 ministers. Then he requested if he could have the microphone. I gave him the microphone, somebody came and took the microphone. And he said, and this is the truth, and still the man is alive, but the pastor and many others in town. He said, I am sorry, I'm quoting the same word. I am sorry if you ask me to pray for something I don't know nothing about. Again, he said, I'm sorry if you ask me to pray for something I don't know nothing about. This is America, most of the Americans don't know nothing about. They are brainwashed what I hear in the, in the media. And I felt, I said, I don't hold this against you. You only walk in the light you hold, Reverend. But I had my Bible and I showed it just like the book, the two colors. There is a story there. The, there's two stories, two, two things that you have to know about. The every page, the back on the, on the front. And when we finish, this is the truth. When he finished, he came this way. I went to court toward him. We hugged each other, and tears were coming down from his eyes. Look, this is the spirit of America. I've been here in this country since 1961 with a college, university, student, individuals. There is I don't know how can I express it. The spirit of America is genuine. Honest. Just tell them the truth. Don't lie to them. And they will say the truth. That is a genuine spirit. Because all of us are not from America except the Indians, God bless them. We all came to this land because of freedom and opportunities. But just as my beloved family must prevail, 30,000 Palestinians have been killed, most of them children and mothers and elders. 1.9 million Palestinians today are displaced. Two universities have been destroyed. 148 schools demolished. 6,500 mosques destroyed. Churches, the historical church of Santa Fenius and the Christians. 20 to 22 hospitals, according to CNN report lately. 60% of the homes are destroyed. All the historical sites and archives have been destroyed or stolen. Over over six, uh, 62,000 tons of bombs dropped on Gaza more than Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 200, over 200,000 bombs, uh, uh, I want to be very, 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 very clear on that. Not since the Vietnam War, Israel dropped hundreds of bombs, 2,000 at each one, 2,000 bombs on gas. Again, for what? For what? Not as too short. Two more things and I'll finish. Our president, God bless him, Carter, really, I, I did like Carter. Um, he wrote a book, you know, um, Palestine Peace, Not Appetite. He says, the general parameter for a long term two state agreement are well known. The president writes, 
There would be no substantive and permanent peace for any peoples in this troubled region as long as Israel is violating key United Nations resolutions, official American policy, and the international roadmap for peace by occupying Arab lands and oppressing the Palestinian except for mutually agreeable negotiated modification. Israel official both pre-1967 border must be armed, as were all previous administrations since the founding of Israel. U.S. government leaders must be in the forefront of achieving this long delayed goal of a just agreement that both sides can honor. Palestine peace, not apartheid, is a challenging, provocative, and courageous in his writings. I'm grateful to my brother for inviting me to burden you with this information, but I think it's not a burden, I hope. I was not a burden to you. I just want to let you know I'm grateful because this side has not been told. I'm not putting anyone down. I'm just saying what I have learned, what I have witnessed, and you only can walk in the life you hold in your, in your hand. As a Palestinian from generation way back from 1568, still have connection to my home. I am born Palestinian, proud to be Palestinian, but also I am proud to be an American. That's my choice. I honor both, teach this to my children, and we hope that you will find an opportunity to visit the Holy Land, the land of peace of, of, of for all people. I wish there is a nation called the nation of the Holy Land for all people. We need to express our voices to our senators and congressmen, to people around us, to have better understanding of the issue, so that you will not be one of these days kicked out of your house. Some may say that's mine. And in, uh, in conclusion, government, I wanted to read this prayer, which I think you are familiar with. Francis of Assisi said, Lord, make me an instrument of, of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love, for it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. My prayer that those who are still on this earth, in the world, especially in that part of the world, whether in Gaza, West Bank, that are suffering daily and being killed, or inside Israel, where peace prevails, where two people can live, neighbor, brothers, and sisters. As before they have lived, they can live again. Nothing is impossible to one who believes. Everything is possible. Again, thank you for this opportunity, Father. Thank you. There are refreshments still out in our effects, and Father will be available, I'm sure, to get questions. Uh, and thank you for your attention and for being here longer than we anticipated.
Well, welcome to the world of the Orthodox Church. <laughs> Father, Father, how long was Mass last? Fifteen minutes. And how long Fifteen minutes in the Orthodox Church. The divine liturgy, though. How long were you there? I'm glad you teach it. <laughs> <laughs> I went to North Saint, Saint George's Orthodox Church in Saint Paul, Minnesota. I called and said, "When does Mass start?" Mm -hmm. And the secretary said, "Well." I'm not sure. She said, people start showing up at 9 o'clock. And I said, oh, okay, when does it end? Well, we're never really sure. You know, I have <laughs> some, sometime around lunchtime. I said, <laughs> okay. Uh, Father, Reverend, uh, we have a parishioner. His son, uh, he's the son of a priest, and his son is a priest. He was not a priest. And, uh, what? And he would head in the altar, like some of you had fallen in the altar. And I didn't have wearing, I don't wear my watch in the Sunday morning. Uh, I mean, I just put it away. So I need to find the time to begin the service. So I said, yeah, okay, what time is it? He said, Father, I never wear a watch on Sunday morning because when I go to meet the Lord, I don't want to be disrupted in time. I want to be with you. So that, so that was an answer for me. Amen. <laughs> thank you, Father. Well, I thank you for listening to this unworthy yeah. priest. Thank you.